Good evening. Tonight's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. Brothers, I could not address you as spirit address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready not, not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, you are not worldly. You are not acting like mere men, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants from whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labour. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay down any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So so then no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos, or Cephas or the world, or life or death, or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I was sorry. Uh, I was reminded this week, uh, after sitting under God's word, uh, what an immense privilege it is to be able to open it and to preach to you. I promise you and assure you, I do not uh, take it lightly, and it is a wonderful privilege. Uh, I'd encourage you to keep the passage open because uh, I do want to stick fairly close to it, uh, as Paul has quite a bit here to say. But I want to ask you the question. Is all ministry blessed by God? Is all Christian ministry approved by God? All ministry that is done in Jesus' name, is it accepted by God? What if you spent, Christian, what if you spent most of your life thinking you're in the center of God's will and you weren't? What if you thought all the ministry, all the serving you've done over many, many years in Christ's name, you thought it was according to God's will, only to find out at the very end that he rejected all of it? Is all ministry and all serving blessed by God? Paul's going to touch on this. Before we jump in, let's just ask the Lord for his help and blessing upon this time. Our Father God, we come before you again in prayer. We could never approach you enough. and We could never ask for help enough from you, Lord. And so we pray as we consider your word that is greatly powerful and life-giving and that is necessary for all of life and godliness. 
we pray that you would bring great illumination and Lord, open up our eyes that we might see exactly what you want us to see, what is written clearly on these pages. I greatly need your help, Lord God, and I am in a room full of people who need your help. And so we humbly ask you, come and meet with us and come and do the work that so pleases you this evening. May your son be lifted up in everything we pray and may your bride shine even brighter as she leaves this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we jump into the text, uh, firstly, I want us to just consider, as we work our way to these points, firstly consider Paul's rebuke to a sinful, divided church. Paul's rebuke, and we see this in the first few verses, but what we jump into here is this is the first major rebuke that he delivers in this letter. There's many more to come, but this is the first major one. Look at verse 1. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I can't address you as spiritual, but worldly, he says, literally there, worldly, fleshly. Those who live according to the sinful nature. I can't address you as people who are led by the Holy Spirit. I can't do it. I can't address you as men and women who walk according to the Spirit. Rather, when I look at you and when I hear about you, I see and hear no difference between you and the world. That's what he says. And he says, I can't address you as spiritual. Can you imagine how deflating a blow that was to the Corinthian church? They prided themselves and boasted that they were so spiritual they had the gifts of prophecy. They had the gifts of healing. They had the spiritual gifts of tongues. And he says, I can't even address you as spiritual. Wow. Can a Christian, can a Christian not be spiritual? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting thought. What's he saying here? The non-Christian is a slave to sin. They're cut off from God. Literally, the scriptures say they are dead in sin. They're completely spiritually void. No spiritual life for the unbeliever. But when God saves a person, when he converts them, he puts in them a new heart and he indwells them with his spirit. And so now they seek to live for him and they are spiritual. Before they were of this world, now they are spiritual. But here's a struggle for the Christian. We get a new heart, a new spirit. His spirit comes within us, but there are still remnants of the old nature within, the flesh or the sinful nature as it were. And so when you read Galatians 5, it says there is this war within the Christian. The Holy Spirit is waging war against our sinful nature within us. Both are fighting against each other. And that's why in Romans 7, Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am, I'm like a schizophrenic. I'm almost like I'm pulled in both ways. But can a Christian be not spiritual? No. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. We're all spiritually alive. Paul's saying here, you do not live according to the Spirit. You yield yourself to your sinful natures. That's what he's getting at here, and he calls them out. But he intensifies the rebuke. Look at it. I can't address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants. You proud Corinthians, you're not spiritual. You are mere babies. Mia, babies, literally the word there is little children. Can you imagine a pastor getting up behind his pulpit and addressing his congregation and says, I am pastoring a bunch of children. Can you imagine that? What a rebuke. What a rebuke. And yet, do you notice how he cushions the rebuke? How does the verse start off? Brothers and sisters, Fellow Christians, I'm not addressing you as unbelievers. You're still brothers and sisters. And do you notice at the end of the verse? Mere infants in Christ. You're not unbelievers. You're just immature, greatly immature. Now, it's far from a compliment, right? 
It has never been a compliment in any generation to call an adult a child. It's never. It's never been a compliment. But he doesn't condemn them as no longer Christians or as those who were never Christians. He doesn't say that. But he elaborates on their infancy. Look at verse 2. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. He talks about baby milk. Now, obviously, there's metaphoric language going on here, and this is normal, right? Every human starts off on milk. No human can start off on solid food. That is impossible. And it's the same for Christians. All Christians must start on milk, and they grow into solid food. As it were, they grow in their understanding of the truth and their application of the truth and their obedience to the truth. So all start on milk, the Corinthians and you and me. So what's the issue here, Paul? Of course you had to give them milk. You see what he says in verse 2? I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready for it. All babies start on milk, but no baby can remain on milk. They can't survive on it. A baby that doesn't transition from milk to solid food is in great danger. There is a serious problem there. They are a massive concern. They need medical examination. They need medical treatment. That can't happen. And yet for the Corinthians, they're not moving from milk to solids. They're not growing as it were. Something is deeply wrong. They need a medical examination. They urgently need medical treatment. And Chloe's household knew it. That's why in chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, Chloe's household have told me that things are not right here. What's the medical treatment they get? The letter of 1 Corinthians, right? Something is deeply wrong here. You know this same problem of spiritual infancy plagued the congregation in the letter to the Hebrews. In chapter 5, it says this. Note the similarities. It says this in chapter 5. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Seems to be a fairly common problem in Christianity. So what have we seen so far in this letter to the Corinthians then? Paul has been giving them the simple message of the cross of Jesus Christ. He's taking them back. They had a head knowledge, but it didn't go deep. It didn't affect the heart. It wasn't outworking. Rather, sin was outworking. They should be growing by now. Roughly, as Paul writes this, it's been about five years since he was first with them. Five years. Can you imagine a five-year-old still on the bottle? They should be growing, and yet they're still infants And they're still immature. Let me quote John MacArthur here. He makes a wonderful comment. Quote, Nothing is more precious or wonderful than a little baby, but a 20-year-old with the mind of an infant is heartbreaking. A baby who acts like a baby is a joy, but an adult who acts like a baby is a tragedy. It doubtlessly grieved the Holy Spirit as it grieved Paul that the Christians in Corinth had never gotten out of their spiritual infancy. End quote. Christian, are you growing? Are you growing? Is there progress? Or are you stagnant? Ask yourself the question. How did their lack of growth manifest? Look at verse 3. You are still worldly. Again, there's that word fleshly. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? You are living according to your sinful nature. And how is it manifesting? Jealousy and quarreling. Fighting and strife. 
Love for God's people was absent, and love is the fundamental virtue of, Christ, of the Christian faith. Love is the foundation, and they were experiencing and demonstrating the very opposite of that. They were not even progressing in love, but there was jealousy and fighting. Jealousy was the inward sinful attitude. And how does jealousy manifest? The outward quarreling and strife. The inward sin overflowed and burst out through the congregation. Notice the jealousy and quarreling led to disunity. Verse 4, For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Paul's already addressed this in, in chapter 1, verse 12, but he didn't deal with it. What did he do? He raised the issue, and then he stopped, and then he taught them about the cross. He taught them about the cross. And now, after teaching them about the cross, he brings it up again. They're acting, he says, you are acting like mere men. He's saying, you're acting like the world. And we see that. I'm of Trump. I'm of Biden. Parties and factions following leaders. And this happens in the church. And Paul says, shall I address you as spiritual? No way. No way. Infants. Infants. That's who I'm dealing with here. Now, do you find his rebuke too harsh? I don't think it is because what is God's will for his people? CHBC, what is God's will for you? Do you know the answer to that question? You will find it on our church webpage, on the homepage, as a matter of fact. What is God's will for us? It's our church mission statement. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Paul writes, We proclaim Christ, teaching and rebuking everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And it wasn't happening in Corinth. Just babies. Not people mature in Christ. We must be growing. Well, that's a rebuke to a sinful, divided church. Next, we see Paul correcting their view of ministers and ministry. Paul correcting their view of ministers and ministry. Look at verses 5 to 7 with me. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, and as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Paul uses here an agricultural metaphor to correct the Corinthians. Right? Agriculture. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. It's as simple as that. What's, what's Paul getting at here? Paul went around and he evangelized. He evangelized Corinth. He planted the seed there. A church was born. He established a church there. And Paul led and taught that church in Corinth for 18 months, planting the seed, planting the seed, planting the seed, winning converts. And then what happened? Paul moved on. There was more work to be done. And Apollos came and carried on the work in Corinth. And Apollos watered the work that Paul had laid down. And the work continued. He continued the work at Corinth. And so the church in Corinth was built upon the shoulders of these two men, as it were. But what happened? The people started taking sides, looking to the leaders and assigning themselves to their leaders, choosing which leader they would call themselves a disciple of. And again, this is what the world does. This is spiritual infancy. How does the world do this? Every time we hear, or we used to hear, President Trump speak, he would boast about all that he accomplished, right? The Trump administration has accomplished this. We have done this. We are making America great again. And now they have Biden. And every time he gets up to speak, he boasts that he's going to undo everything that Trump did and correct all the foolishness and folly of the previous administration. Boasting, boasting. This is our world leaders. What does the great leaders of the church say? Paul writes, what is Paul? And what is Apollos? 
neither of these men are anything. You see the difference? You see the difference between leadership in the church and leadership in the world? The Apostle Paul, he takes the mic and he says, what is Paul? What is Apollos? And when you hear that, you have to say to Paul, how can you say that? How can you say that about Apollos? How can you say that about yourself? Because do you know what the scripture says about Apollos? In Acts chapter 18, it says he was an eloquent man and he was mighty in the scriptures. And it says in Acts chapter 18 that he spoke boldly in the synagogues and he encouraged many who came to faith. Scripture says he was a mighty man. And Paul, how can you say that you are nothing? You took the gospel from Israel and you took it to the ends of the earth and everywhere you went, you won converts and you planted churches. You evangelized and you won souls through sweat and blood and many tears. That's how you reach the world, through your evangelism. You wrote most of our New Testament and, and you sealed your testimony with your own blood when you're martyred in Rome, how can you say, what is Paul? How can you say that? And Paul here, he smashes, smashes the pedestal that the Corinthians had put underneath him and Apollos. Look how he further humbles himself and Apollos. Verse 6, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it. How did Paul liken himself? He says, your leaders, we are nothing more than farmhands. Nothing more than that. I planted seeds. And guess what? Apollos came behind me carrying a watering can. Go build a plaque for us. Do you see the difference? This is the message of the cross. This is the overflow of the cross. This is living a crucified life. This is how the cross affects us. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, before he went to the cross, compared himself to a farmer. You know his teaching. A man went out and scattered the seed. Paul is correcting their division and their view of leadership and he wants the glory to go to God. Do you see how he does it? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. God gave the growth. Understand, planting is vital work, planting the seed. Watering is vital work, but the miraculous, that's the growing power. That's the growing power when life comes forth, when life and growth happens. See, planting is necessary, but planters are replaceable. Watering and waterers are necessary, but they are replaceable. But growth, only God can bring that. And guess what? There's only one God. He's irreplaceable. Do you see his argument? This is the right perspective of ministers. And that's why he can say, the one who plants and waters aren't anything and nothing but God. And so this is the right view of leaders, of ministry, of ministers and servants. Yes, encourage leaders. Yes, encourage them. Yes, show them honor. But you're not their disciples. You are not their disciples. Remember what Paul said? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? You're not disciples of your pastors. And so he's corrected their wrong view of ministers. And look how he gives them the correct instruction of ministry. Look at verse 8. Of ministry, he corrects it. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. Literally, the, N the NIV says they have one purpose. In the Greek, it's literally the one who plants and the one who waters are one. That's it. Are one. Do you see how much insight there is in that one statement about ministry? Do you see, church, how much we learn from that one verse? Ministry is never, ever, ever done in isolation. It is never a solo effort. Our ministry, our serving is to be complementary to each other's ministering and serving. 
We are one. We are a team. Paul is saying, Apollos and myself, we weren't competitors. Why are you pitting us against each other? We're partners. We're partners. And we have the planter and the waterer. We have one goal, and that is to see a glorious crop. That's our goal. Different tasks, but we are one, and we have one goal. CHBC, as your pastors, we labor to preach to you and implant the seed of the Word of God. We want to feed you consistently with the Word of God. And what is supposed to happen with the ministries in our church? It's supposed to work with that. So we have BCG groups and we seek to bring new believers into that. And BCG leaders are supposed to water the seed that's been planted here by teaching sound doctrine and going deeper in teaching and application. All our ministries are supposed to be complementary. Sunday school, youth group, they involve planting and watering, planting for the unbelieving children and also watering at the same time. The watering is supporting the work that Christian parents should be doing in the home. Do you see, the, see how they had to complement each other? Play group, evangelizing, sowing the seed, and for those who have Christian families, watering and supporting the work that parents are doing. Do you see how it's all complementary? One-on-one discipleship. When you meet together, you are praying for one another. You are talking with one another about the Word of God, what you have heard, what you're learning, and you're encouraging and building each other up. And the guys and the team that goes up to the metro station to evangelize the lost, there is a reason why we do it at that station, because it's right next to our local church. So as we plant the seed and we seek to win souls for Christ, we can say, come into here, come into our church upon believing in Christ so that you can be watered and grow. Do you see how everything, we have one purpose. At least that's God's design for ministry. The planter and the waterer are one. See, some are planting, some are watering, but all have the same goal, a glorious crop. I hope you see that to see the lost saved and believers built up in the faith so that we can present everyone mature in Christ. For the sake of the crop, we must be one. Can I just give one last detail on this section before we move into the final section? Have a look as Paul's correcting their view of ministry. He reminds them of the privilege of ministry. Look at verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers You are God's field, God's building. He says, we are God's fellow workers. Literally, we are God's co-workers. We are his offsiders. Does that blow your mind? Does that not amaze you? God has invited us as his fellow workers to participate in the very work of God. So when you evangelize the lost, you are participating in the work of God. When you're teaching the children, you are participating in the very work of God. When you are going to BCG and teaching, when you're ministering and serving, when you're up here serving and singing, you are participating in the very work of God, His mission in this world. Is there any greater privileged people than us? As I said to you, sitting under this text, I again remembered it is the greatest privilege to preach the word of God to you and to care for your souls. We work with God and we see that in the Great Commission. Go make disciples and how does he finish it off? And I am with you even to the very end. We're doing this together. We are doing this together. So we've seen Paul's rebuke We've seen Paul correct their view of ministers and ministry. And lastly, I want you to see all ministry and all serving will be tested by God. All ministry, all serving will be tested by God. Notice the shift in metaphor. Look at verse 9 and 10. For we are God's fellow workers. 
for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Verse 10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds. Do you notice the shift in the metaphor? We, we move from being God's field in verse 9 and the end of verse 9, God's building. And then as verse 10 progresses, you see the word builder, building, builder. We move from agricultural metaphor to architectural metaphor. It's very simple. But he's transitioning because he wants to teach us something here. Paul himself now changes the metaphor regarding him. I was a farm hand, now I'm an expert builder. I'm a contracted builder. And he calls himself an expert builder. Literally, they're a wise master builder. Now, what was, the, what was the building that God called Paul to do? What was the task that God assigned him? He says it there, I laid a foundation. It's very significant. The foundation is the critical piece of every building, right? You know that. You can have the flashiest, shiniest building and structure. If the foundation is corrupted, the whole thing's coming down. It doesn't matter how pretty it is. Paul says, as a master builder, I laid the foundation. What was the foundation that Paul laid? This master builder, what was it? He says in verse 11, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ, he says. And so this is what Paul would do. He would evangelize a region. He would win converts to Christ. He would establish churches and he would lay the foundation of Jesus Christ as long as he could there. This is what he did, planted churches and lay the foundation of each of them. He knew what God's calling was for his life as an apostle. He went around laying the foundation. He was not ignorant of his calling. And what an incredible Christian Paul was. What a mighty man and and what work he accomplished for God. He gave everything to God and yet look how quickly Paul seeks to divert your gaze from him. Did you see it? Verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Paul's giftedness, given by God. Paul's energy, supplied by God. Paul's effectiveness, granted by God. Paul's power, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he says, by the grace given to me. You will never find in Paul's letters him seeking praise from the Christians. But what do you continually find in his letters? He doesn't seek praise. He seeks their prayers. Because he understands he needs the grace of God upon his life. The work of God. And so he always says, pray for me, brothers. Pray for me, brothers. Do you see how he directs the glory to God? Paul says, as an expert builder. But understand this, he is not the only builder in the projects that God is doing. He's not the only one. Verse 10, did you see it? I laid the foundation and someone else is building upon it. Was Paul angry that someone was building on his work? Was he supposed to be the only builder? Of course he wasn't. Look at the end of verse 10. Each person should be careful how he builds. What did Paul do? He laid foundations. Our foundation isn't a completed project. The work must go on. And so Apollos came. And there were people after Apollos. Now what does this building work? Paul says, I built, and now others are building, and each of you should be careful how you build. What's this building work? What's it referring to here? It's referring to the teaching and the instruction, the ministry of the apostles, pastors, and teachers. That's what he's referring to there. But it's not only them. The building work applies to every Christian. Listen carefully. I didn't put a slide up there. Listen very carefully to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12. This is such a significant verse for the local church. And notice how it ties in with the language here. Listen carefully. Verse 11, it was Christ who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. In that verse, 
Who's doing the building? The apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists. And they're equipping all of the saints for the work of the ministry so that they can build up the body of Christ. Everyone is building. Every Christian is building. And so he says, be careful how you build. Foundations laid, be careful how you build upon it. Paul's concerned about what's going on, about what he started. He wants to see the work continue according to God's will. Every builder is concerned about this. Paul many times laid a foundation and you read, say, for example, in Galatians that false teachers came in and they started building on it, but they started building, building what was contrary to the foundation. So often it was false teachers, but sometimes it wasn't false teachers. Sometimes it was just the ministry and the character of the congregation. And that's what we have in, this, in the Corinthian church. The way that they were living, the way that they were serving, the way that they functioned as a church was not in compliance with the foundation. And Paul reminds them that Jesus is the foundation. Look at verse 11. For no one can lay any other foundation than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Why does he remind them of this? What have we seen in this letter? They're building with human wisdom. They're doing ministry. They're seeing themselves. They're seeing the Christian life based upon what the culture and society values and esteems. And what they are doing is incompatible with the foundation. The foundation will not support that kind of building. Jesus and earthly wisdom, Jesus and division will not be part of the same structure. It's incompatible. There's a lesson here for us. Our works and our serving is meant to build up the people of God. And now Paul is going to show us here He's going to show that God takes it very seriously. And so, because he takes it so seriously, there will be rewards for Christians and there will be great loss for Christians. Look at verses 12 to 13. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Keeping the metaphor... He says our work and our serving is like is compared to building materials. Now, did you see those materials there in verse 12? The list of materials can be divided into two categories. You can see that, right, at face value. Do you see them? Gold, silver, costly stones. And then the second category, wood, hay, and straw. The first category refers to superior materials, precious materials, imperishable materials, right? Gold, silver, costly stones. The second lot of materials used by some Christians are weaker materials, inferior materials, materials that will perish, wood, hay, and straw. Make no mistake about it, every single Christian is building. Every Christian is building. But the big question is, not is every Christian building. The big question is, what materials are you building with? What are you building with? Your life. Look over your life, your conduct, your works, your serving, your ministering. Is it gold? Or is it hay? What is it? Well, there's only one way to truly test it. There's only one way to test what you're building with and what I'm building with. Look at verse 13. His work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. How will we tell? Fire. God's fire. Everything will be exposed by God's fire. When will this happen? It says the day will bring it to light. That is, friends, judgment day. And it will be revealed with fire. Have you seen how much the New Testament compares the second coming to fire? I'm not even talking about hell. Jesus' very appearing is likened to a fire event. It says this in 2 Thessalonians, The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven in blazing fire. What about the character of the Lord Jesus Christ? How is he characterized? 
Revelation chapter 2, it says this about him. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire. I know your deeds. He knows your ministry and your serving. And judgment day is compared, the whole thing is compared to a fiery event. 2 Peter 3 says this, The elements and the earth will melt in burning heat, and all its works will be laid bare. You see that? And so we find here, Paul is teaching us, there will be two kinds of Christians on judgment day. Two kinds of Christians. Let me show you who they are. Firstly, profitable Christian laborers profitable Christian laborers. Look at verse 14. If what he has built survives, that is, survives the fire, he will receive his reward. There will be some Christians on judgment day who are richly rewarded by God. Who will be rewarded by God. Do you understand how significant and how incredible this is in light of what we've seen so far? What has Paul just said? We are farmhands. We are servants. We are nothing. We don't even possess the power to produce growth. And yet, if we labor according to his will, if we are faithful with what he has entrusted and assigned to us, he will richly reward us. How can that be? Isn't that astonishing? He was the one who brought the results. He is the one that's doing the great work. It's his power. He's the one that gives gifts. Think about it. Michael Jordan, he never thanked his shoes. Picasso never praised his brushes. And yet God places great honor and lavishes rewards and praise upon his servants, mere instruments that he used to accomplish his work. Can you imagine such a God? This is the God that he is, who will reward us. Can you imagine on that day when you're standing before God, Christian, and he summons you to himself, and he begins laying crown after crown after crown after crown upon your head, and you're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, and you say, how can this be? I didn't have the power to convert anyone. I didn't even have the power to build up Christians and bring change in their life. You were the one that possessed all the power. You brought all the results. These crowns, they belong to you. Why are you doing this? And will not God respond? My dear child, it has been grace from start to finish. It's been grace from start to finish. Come and enjoy your rewards. This is the God who rewards his people. So if you are serving the Lord faithfully with eternal perspective according to his will, there are great rewards waiting for you and your labor is not in vain. There is a second kind of Christian that we read of here that will be found out on Judgment Day and it is the unprofitable laboring Christian. The unprofitable laboring Christian. Look at verse 15. If his work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Do you see that? He, his work, his ministry, his serving, everything he has done is going to burn up. It's going to go up in smoke. It will be revealed on that day, everything he ever did to be nothing more than wood, hay, and straw. It appeared to be the Lord's work. From everyone else's perspective, it looked to be done in Jesus' name with God's blessing upon it. And it's going to be burned up and becoming a pile of rubble. We see this today. This is a great warning towards Christianity today. Churches, the way services are done, programs and ministries are done. How much is done for the sake of numbers? How much is done today for the sake of giving people what they want so we can fill up all the seats? Christianity and churches have found that it is much easier and much quicker to build with hay than gold. It's much quicker. It's much easier. It's much more resourceful. And it's all going to be burned up. What about us? 
There's no point in me talking about what's going on out there. What about us, CHBC? What about me? What about you? What about us as a body? SRE, Scripture in Schools. Is that gold or is that hay? What's going on there? Are we teaching them narratives and Bible characters that we hope they can remember? Or are we bringing them the gospel and introducing them to Jesus Christ? Blokes, mingles, rocks, gems. Is it gold or is it hay, what we're doing? Golf ministry. Our Sunday school work. Again, are we teaching them mere stories and narratives and hopefully they can remember at the end of the day it was Abraham, not Isaac? Or are we calling them to see and consider who God is and showing them that they really, really, despite who their parents are, they need a saviour. And there is only one. And it doesn't matter how little they are, their sins are just as great and need atoning just like their parents. Are we doing that? Is your service, is our serving wood or gold? You who are in the music ministry, why do you do it and how do you do it? Do you do it for the love of music? Do you do it as a performance or do you do it because you want to worship God and you want to see the people here worshiping God and you want them to encounter God through the lyrics of the beautiful words that we sing unto him? Those who are evangelizing at the metro, do you do it out of guilt? Do you do it to be seen by other Christians to see that you're actually fulfilling the Great Commission or do you really, really, really want to see people saved because they're going to hell? And I could rattle on ministry after ministry. You who help in the youth group. Do you love those young people? And do you care about where they're going? Or can you just relate to them because you're all so young? And it's a nice time slot in the week. Think about all of your serving. I know this is uncomfortable. I'm not trying to anger you. I'm just trying by the grace of God to prevent heartache on that final day. Can you imagine seeing years upon years that you labored for Christ, burned up before your eyes? You only get one shot. You only get one shot at this. Is it done according to his will? Can I say one last comment before I finish here? One last comment in this. This judgment that we're talking about, it's not for hell. This loss, it's not for hell. Did you see the verse? Verse 15. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You won't go to hell for this, Christian. You won't lose your salvation, but you will lose everything. You will lose everything. You won't be condemned for your sins because Jesus was. You won't be punished by God on that day because Jesus was. Praise God for that but you'll lose everything. And and the imagery here, such a person will be saved, but only as one escapes through the fire. He wants you to get the imagery of Lot. He was a Christian. He didn't perish with Sodom, but he escaped through the fire and he lost everything. Everything, even his wife, his sons-in-law, everything he owned. He lost his testimony in that place. Let me quote Garland. He writes this, quote, Even failures will be conf- included in salvation, but they will enter salvation smelling of smoke, their labor gone up in smoke. It's a sobering warning, isn't it? Now, something was very dear to me as I was thinking about this, and I saw it in myself. I've seen it in myself in the past, and I hear it from Christians today. When, whenever we're rewards, and that is talked about, Christians say things like this, I don't really care about getting rewards from God. I don't really care about that. I don't really care about having a really, really fruitful ministry. I don't really care about doing something really great for the kingdom of God. All I care about is getting to heaven and escaping from hell. With that, if that happens, I will be content. If that is you, Christian, if that is you, may God snap you out of it tonight. May he snap you out of it. What do I mean by that? God gave us everything. 
He gave us His only Son. Christ gave up everything. He laid down His very life. He died for us. Christian, aren't you dying to live for Him? Give yourself for Him. Don't worry. Don't hope that you just don't burn in hell. Burn for Him while you live. Give everything to Him. And do it according to His will. Serve Him according to His will. Is every ministry acceptable to God? Is, is all service done in Jesus' name approved by God? Please, please, tonight examine everything that you've done, all that you're doing, the direction that you're heading, what you give yourself to. Is it gold? Or is it hay? Is it approved by God? Or will it burn up and become nothing more than rubble? He who has ears to hear, let him hear the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. Father, we are overwhelmed with amazement that you have rewards stored up for faithful servants. As the song says, every crown we receive, we want to lay it at your feet. We don't deserve these things. It is a privilege. It is a privilege to be fellow workers with you, O oh God, to be invited into the work and the ministry of God. Lord, we are overwhelmed at the thought that you will richly reward us for our labors and that you see everything, everything, the things that others don't see. But God, we tremble, and it is a painful task of self-examination to consider our ministry, to consider our service. But I pray that we would not be proud. Please don't let us be proud and disregard these things, to be proud of our ministries as if they're free from examination. Please, Lord God, search us and show us if there is anything that is not pleasing to you. May you show us, and may you show us the right way, so that we may please you, that we may live lives pleasing to you. And God, that we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, on that final day. Lord, we humbly ask this of you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us right where we are. We praise you. And we glorify you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord of the Church. Amen. Please, let's join and sing uh, with one voice together.